Hello everyone. Welcome back to Robotic Mechatronic System Design course. We will continue with the second lecture, lecture 2, sensors used in MPS 500. Today's topics are as follows. Sensors in each station and I will explain again each station in the video. Um, what are their tasks and you could allocate the sensors on a real system. Optoelectronic sensors, we will dip into the optoelectronic sensors and see what are their functionalities and how do they work. Proximity sensors, micro switches, displacement encoder and comparator. Again, uh, there are some useful YouTube videos that uh, you might wish to watch them through all the lecture courses. Plus, you could refer to uh, ROP 308 Industrial Automation course to get more and extensive knowledge on sensors, PLCs, and other topics as well. List of sensors in each station. There are several sensors using each station. Below, you will find a complete list of the available sensors. So uh, if you watch the MPS 500 video again, which is available on Moodle, you will see that the core section and core part is the conveyor. And conveyor itself has lots of sensors. We have proximity sensors, so you see the picture here and the symbol. So try to remember symbols and uh, for now just visually get what is a symbol because later when it comes to the festo fluid sim simulation, you could use these symbols to um, accomplish your simulation. Fiber optic units and these fiber optic units and proximity sensors are all over these MPS 500, not only the conveyor and the fiber optic cables that um, connect these uh, fiber optic units to uh, the basically uh, uh, to, to, to basically the place that we need the laser and we need the uh, we need the fiber optic to be located okay so uh, we, need, we use this fiber in combination of these units okay so we don't have the video of the conveyor separately but you will see similar sensors in all other stations so don't worry we'll see them uh, many times again in other stations and videos okay so what is the first station uh, apart from the conveyor sensor which is the core part is the distributing station and on this station we'll see in the video later that we have micro switch this is the micro switch the mechanical switch and we have these rollers that, that uh, when when a part come in contact with the roller uh, the lower uh, the roller will be pressed and you will send a signal that uh, the, there is a part, there is a mechanical bar part present. So we could use these micro switches as, uh, or these limit switches um, at the end of the cylinders, pneumatic cylinders, or at the beginning and end of the uh, pneumatic rotary actuators. And it shows us what is the, uh, position of the uh, pneumatic actuator not exact position but shows us if the cylinder is um, if the piston is at the beginning or is at the end so we usually have two of these um, located on a pneumatic actuator have proximity sensor uh, which are electric with read contact and we have uh, three different kinds of proximity sensors. Um, I will explain them when it comes to the proximity sensor part. What are the differences? You will see what is exactly the read contact. But now, um, 
as it is clear from the name, when a part comes close to the sensor, uh, specifically a, a metallic part or a magnetic part, then these proximity sensors will be activated. So the read contact specifically is designed to sense, um, uh, is designed to sense um, magnetic parts. Okay, so on the distributing station, we have optoelectric sensors. We have different kind of these optoelectric sensors. Uh, uh, we have uh, receivers and we have emitter, and these are used um, to uh, check connectivity of the distributing station with the next station, which is the testing station. Okay, so let's watch this video and uh, see in more detail what is exactly this distributing station and uh, if we could locate the sensors on the video. Okay, so this is the distributing station. You see this, this uh, swivel uh, semi-rotary pneumatic actuator that picks the part from here and place it on the testing station and more accurately place it on the elevator of the testing station. They have this magazine here, okay, that we put uh, basically parts inside the magazine and we have one pneumatic cylinder that pushes these parts forward. Okay, so provides the part from the magazine and then this uh, swivel will come and pick the part by vacuum. Okay, so what we have here and what we could see here, we have this pneumatic cylinder and on this pneumatic cylinder is not clear from the video, but we have two proximity sensors, one at the beginning and one at the end, that uh, basically uh, will send a signal to the PLC to show uh, what is the location of the cylinder. Here we have uh, optoelectric sensor. Okay, so this is the optoelectric fiber that goes to the uh, optoelectric sensor located on the um, on the station. It's not clear from this video now, uh, but what it does here, this laser, uh, it sends a signal if the magazine is empty. So when the magazine is empty, the, it sends a signal to the PLC, and PLC will stop the station. So let's continue watching the video. Okay, so you see that now the swivel comes to pick the part by this vacuum cap here. This is a vacuum cap that sucks the part. And this is the cylinder that provides the part. You see the, uh, there's an optoelectric fiber here. And here on these uh, 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 semi-rotary um, pneumatic actuator here, they have two limit switches. But these switches shows us, or basically sends a signal to the PLC what is the location of these uh, swivel arm. So what else you could see here, these uh, blue and black pipes, those are all uh, pneumatic pipes. And these pipes are connected to a compressor. Compressor is, uh, is located between the, uh, uh, between the core conveyor station. So you see that this is the elevator on the testing station. This is on another station that elevates the part and feeds that to the conveyor. So from this side, you could see the micro uh, limit switches on this side. 
okay and here you could see some part of the vacuum this is uh, basically the venturi this is the venturi and the filter Okay, nice. Here you see these uh, uh, limit switches. <clears throat> okay, so you see when this uh, mechanical part attached to the rotary actuator comes in contact with the um, with the roller of the limit switch, then it will be activated and send the signal to the PLC. Okay, so these are um, uh, all the sensors on the testing station. Uh, this is the place that the swivel will place the part and the elevator will elevate the part. So we will explain that when it comes to the testing station. Okay, so now the part is placed by the swivel on the elevator. And uh, elevator basically will elevate the part and we'll test uh, the part. Okay, so uh, what we have on the testing station, we have uh, again a proximity sensor. We have proximity sensor, different types actually. Um, these are the sensors uh, located on the elevator, pneumatic cylinder. We have this type of the uh, read contact proximity sensors attached. Uh, to the uh, cylinder that uh, kicks the part uh, to the airway slide and we have lots of optoelectric sensors so why specifically we are talking about the mps 500 because this is a very good show example this is a very nice uh, station that shows you what sensors could be available in an automa um, automation system okay so in any mechatronic parts you will see different type of sensors very similar to these ones what again we have on the testing station because this is the testing station we are going to test the part if the part is proper so we have lots of sensors um, we have these retroreflective sensors, and these retroreflective sensors basically works in combination of a retroreflective mirror. Okay, so this is a, a mirror. So we have this laser beam, and we have a mirror, um, and shows a presence of the part between the mirror and the emitter. So this one is emitter and receiver at the same time. We have this optoelectric sensor diffuse light sensor. Okay, so these diffuse light sensors, uh, again, they are emitter and the receivers, uh, both at the same time. And I will, I will explain when it comes to the optoelectric sensors, uh, what are these different types of optoelectric sensors. And we have also these transmitters receivers, they are used uh, to check a connectivity and presence of the neighboring station. Uh, we have a capacitive proximity sensor. Those are big sensors. I will show you in the video again. Um, they, uh, they basically could sense 
any materials, plastic, glass, uh, metallic, non-metallic, so it doesn't matter. So this is the difference between capacitive proximity sensors uh, and inductive proximity sensors. The inductive proximity sensors could only um, could only uh, sense a presence of metallic part, but uh, capacitive proximity sensors um, could sense any metallic and non-metallic materials. And we have a displacement encoder, which is a, a linear potentiometer. So this is a linear potentiometer that goes in and out here for installing on cylinders um, using a mount kit. I will show you on the video what is that. So we check the height of the part by these linear potentiometer or displacement encoder. And uh, we have this analog uh, comparator because the output of these potentiometers um, is an uh, analog signal. And we need to send, in most of cases, we need to send digital input to PLCs. So these comparators will provide this digital uh, signal. Okay, so we'll get the analog signal from the displacement and we'll convert them to the digital signal. So height measurement from zero to 25 millimeter at the voltage, voltage of zero to 100% are covered. So uh, zero is equal to the zero voltage and 25 millimeter is equal to the 100% of the voltage, which is 24 volt, if I don't mistake, is 24 volt on these uh, sensors. The absolute value of the voltage depends on the supply to the potentiometer via connections one and three. So I will explain this uh, comparator uh, later in the coming slides in more detail. Okay, so let's watch the video what we have on the district view. Um, um, okay, so this is a yeah. Okay, so this is a video uh, which is distributing and testing stations both at the same time. And after this video, uh, we will watch another video which is a testing station. Okay, so I I explain fully what is this swivel and uh, what is this uh, a cylinder and the magazine. Let's continue now and see, okay, so we are picking the part by the vacuum cap, now is placed on the elevator. So, okay, so here you could see a capacitive sensor. This is a capacitive sensor. And the diffuse sensor is here. Hopefully we'll see that in another angle, it's diffuse sensor. Okay, now is elevated. Okay, and this is a linear potentiometer that we talk about that, okay? So this one is adjustable. We could bring it up and down, adjust it. And if the part, for example, is too big or is too small, then it could detect. It could detect these parts, okay? And basically we could, what we could do, we could uh, uh, eject these uh, parts uh, to the separate slide. Okay, so it's, you could see this slide here. Okay, so broken parts. <clears throat> okay, so broken parts basically could be rejected to another slide. So here in this video, they have another uh, station. Okay, so which is not as uh, similar to or MPS 500. What we have here is a conveyor that uh, basically those pallets will arrive here and these cylinders will be dropped on the pallets. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now we have, okay.
this is a testing station okay so you see this is the diffuse sensor and this is a capacitive sensor okay so this diffuse sensor could check color of the part if this one is red black uh, silver and so on and so forth uh, a wide range of colors could be detected by diffuse sensors which are optoelectric sensors and the capacitive sensor could detect the part uh, could uh, detect both metallic and non-metallic Okay, so this is a retroreflective sensor, and as I said, uh, it checks the presence of the swivel. If swivel is on the way, or if there is any part on the way of the elevator, the elevator doesn't work. So in front of this emitter receiver, there is a retroreflective mirror, which is a special mirror, and we have this laser beam here. Okay, if there is any part or object that cuts the beam, then uh, it sends a signal to the PLC and PLC will stop the elevator. Let's watch the video again from the beginning. Okay, so this is a linear potentiometer that checks the height of the part. So you see, now it's compressed and this potentiometer could send a signal to the comparator and comparator could check if this is in a low or medium or high range and send a digital signal to the PLC. And here we have uh, these uh, big uh, also uh, capacitive sensor here, okay, that checks the presence of the part here. On the elevator itself, we have two inductive sensors at the beginning of the pneumatic cylinder and at the end of the pneumatic cylinder. And this is the airway slide. This is the airway slide, and now the parts is sliding to the pallet. Okay, so here it's very clear here on this cylinder that we have one uh, inductive sensor. Okay, this is an inductive sensor here. And you see the, uh, the light is on on the sensor. Okay, light goes off. Why? Because the piston move forward. Okay, so this sensor is allocated at the beginning of the cylinder and shows the position of the uh, piston at the beginning of the cylinder. Okay, nice video. Let's continue with other stations. Uh, we have handling station. Again, I recommend you to watch the MPS 500 uh, video demo and see uh, what are location of all stations. Okay, um, and see uh, where are, for example, handling stations on MPS 500. Okay, we have again proximity sensors. Wherever we have pneumatic actuators, we have these proximity sensors. 
we have receivers and emitters, and we have fiber optic devices, and we have optoelectronic sensors and inductive proximity sensors. Hopefully, I will have a chance to show you on video as we go forward through, uh, through this course, you will see lots of examples how these sensors are used. Okay, so this is a handling station. This is a crane, basically, okay? It's a crane or kind of like a Cartesian robot, okay? It's a uh, two-dimensional Cartesian robot, okay? We have one cylinder here and one cylinder here. One cylinder moves uh, where, uh, sorry, horizontally, the other one moves vertically, and we have a gripper at the end that picks the part. And these are pallets waiting uh, uh, in front of the handling station. And these pallets came from the uh, testing station. Okay, now we want to pick the part. Okay. So you see here, this is an uh, optoelectric cable, and we have this optoelectric sensor here. So with this sensor, we could check presence of the part, plus we could check color of the part. And this cable goes to what? It goes to the uh, optoelectric unit. And that optoelectric unit is somewhere um, on the handling station. This one is a pneumatic gripper of Pesto. Uh, and on this one also on the other side, is not clear from this side, we have inductive sensors. We have inductive sensors wherever we have a pneumatic actuator. So it doesn't matter if it's linear or rotary because we need to know what is the position of those pneumatic actuators. Okay, now the part is picked. And we have uh, a, a nice picture of the optoelectric sensor here on the gripper. So these are these blue lines are pneumatic uh, pipes that comes to this cylinder. When it comes to the pneumatic uh, actuators, we will explain those stuff in more detail. Okay, so this is a processing station. I, I will explain that later. So the handling station will pick, uh, pick the part from the pallet and place it on the processing station. Okay, so processing station basically, um, we do some processing on the part. Uh, we do the drilling, uh, polishing, and again, the part is ready. Now the handling station could pick the part. And here we have another um, optoelectric sensor. And the crane, unfortunately, is not obvious. We have also, because this crane itself is, uh, is, an, um, uh, is a pneumatic actuator. Okay, so this is a pneumatic actuator. And at the beginning and end, we have um, inductive sensors. Okay.
let's proceed with the processing station. We have uh, in processing station we have micro switch similar to the one we had on distributing station proximity sensor. Uh, we have optoelectric sensor. This is a proximity sensor. These are optoelectric sensors and units, and we have a capacitive proximity sensor, okay? not the inductive one. This is the inductive one, and this is a capacitive proximity sensor. Again, inductive proximity sensors could only sense metallic uh, or magnetic parts, but capacitive proximity sensors could detect any type of parts. Let's watch a video of processing station. Okay, so this video also shows what um, what buttons, let's say, we have on each station. We have a start button, we have stop button, we have reset, and we have two light indicators, and we have auto manual switch. On the start and the reset, also we have two LEDs. So these LEDs plus these light indicators are output of the PLC. We could program them, um, and based on our program, they will either flash or they will go uh, solid green or red based on their type. Uh, plus these start, reset, and stop, and auto manual switches are input to the PLC. So they work based on our PLC programming. This is a PLC here underneath, underneath of the station. This is a PLC, and this is a one type of Siemens PLC, which is different from the type we have on the lab, but but doesn't matter, yes? Uh, we could basically program any type of PLCs. Uh, as far as it accepts enough number of inputs and outputs, we could program that. So now, for example, the operator tries to um, start the station based on their uh, program on the PLC. Okay, so now let's say the, the station is working. You see again these, okay, so you just saw the, the proximity sensor there underneath. Okay, so that proximity sensor is underneath here. Let me see if I could, okay. So here this proximity sensor that shows uh, the presence of the part. When the parts arrive, this proximity sensor will send a signal to the PLC. Plus here again, we have one, another proximity sensor. Here you could see those optoelectric units. Okay, and you see that these optoelectric cables come to these units. Okay, so what else I could show you here? Let's continue. Okay, so they have a different setup, but it doesn't matter. My focus is at the proximity sense, uh, prox sorry, processing station itself. Okay, so you could see these capacitive sensors. So you might, you know, you might ask yourself why we are studying these particular mechatronic systems. Okay, so you could study any, uh, any mechatronic system, but these are educational stations uh, plus we have lots of materials uh, and plus lots of materials are available online. If you learn these sensors, if you learn these parts, uh, either mechanical parts or um, electronic parts, if you learn the PLC, then when you join a workspace in a factory, you could 
easily understand the logic and uh, locate the parts, fix them and work with them. Okay. Let's continue now with the sorting station. We have again proximity sensors, optoelectronic sensors, uh, different type of optoelectronic sensors we have on this station. Let's watch the video. Okay, so again, we have a handling station. This is a handling station. Okay, let me show you here. This is a handling station here. Okay, so this handling station picks the part from uh, the pallet on the conveyor and put it on the sorting station. Why sort? Why we call it sorting station? We have three slides and we could sort parts based on their color and the material properties. We have red, black, and metallic silver parts. And we could sort them here because uh, let's say this is a shipment of the company we want to put them in a box and uh, load them on a truck and send them to the warehouse or distributor let's continue watching okay so we have two handling stations on this mps 500 one is attached to the processing station and one is attached to the uh, sorting station okay so there is one small conveyor here part will be placed on the conveyor there is one stopper here this stopper is uh, uh, is a basically uh, a pneumatic actuator okay we have double acting pneumatic actuator and single acting pneumatic actuator. This one is a single acting pneumatic actuator that I will explain when it comes to the pneumatic parts. And this, pneuma this pneumatic actuator will stop the part because without this stopper, the part will move forward. And then we have here a proximity sensor and optoelectric sensor. Combination of these two sensors could uh, say us if there is any part presence plus uh, what uh, if the part is metallic or non-metallic metallic plus we could check the color of the part so based on this information we could uh, decide um, uh, which slide the part should be placed in and we have these two guides here again we have these two double acting pneumatic actuators here that will rotate these guides um, and basically will guide the part into the proper slide. You could see on these, uh, on these pneumatic actuator two proximity sensors. Okay. So as I said, anywhere we have pneumatic actuators, we must have at least one, and in most of the cases, two um, uh, inductive proximity sensors. 
Okay, let's continue now. Okay, plus, okay, very nice uh, view here. We have retroreflective optoelectric sensor. This is an optoelectric sensor here, and this is a retroreflective mirror. This is a very special mirror. I will explain what are properties of this mirror later. Okay, and we have this laser beam here. When the part passes this beam, it cuts the beam and will send the signal to the PLC. When the slide is full, for example, the beam will be cut permanently and will send the signal to the PLC. And again, based on the timing, we could decide if we should stop the sorting station and send the part to the storage, or the parts should come to the sorting station. Okay, so nice view here. We're gonna basically place the part on the sorting station. We have this optoelectric sensor. This is an optoelectric cable that goes to the optoelectric unit. We have a proximity sensor. And this is a stopper, okay, that stops the part. So stopper stops the part. You see the light. This is the light of the optoelectric sensor. There is another optoelectric sensor once we place the part here, this optoelectric sensor sends a signal to the PLC, and the PLC will activate this stopper, okay? So because there is a delay between these decisions sending, receiving, and the conveyor is moving, we need to have one sensor uh, basically forward. Now this sensor is used to check the color, plus this one could check uh, existence of the part plus if the part is metallic okay because as i said inductive proximity sensors could only uh, sense metallic parts so based on this information we will decide um, and we'll understand the material and the color of the part is black or red now and or silver Yes, or silver, this one was silver. And based on that, we will actuate these guides. So here you see the inductive sensors on these uh, double acting pneumatic actuators. Why these are double acting? Because they have two inputs. We will explain that when it comes to the pneumatic parts. This is that uh, retroreflective optoelectric sensor that they said. Uh, it, this is a meter and receiver at the same time. Okay. Okay, so let's continue and talk about the optoelectric sensors, uh, different types. Optoelectric sensors are used mainly for detecting objects. Three main types of photoelectric sensors are available. The first one is true, um, a true beam. Okay, so this true beam, we have a meter and we have a receiver. So these are two separate units and we have a beam, we call it true beam. And when the object uh, interrupt the light, then uh, we could sense uh, a presence of a part. We have a retroreflective or reflex units, both emitter and receiver in the same unit. And we have retroreflector mirror here and we could uh, uh, check the presence of a part. And we have diffuse proximity sensor as we had in uh, testing a station and in uh, sorting also a station used this type of diffuse sensors. 
So in diffuse sensors, you have emitter and receiver in the same unit, but we don't have a special mirror as a re retro reflectors uh, re and retro reflective uh, basically units. So we don't have any mirror. The object itself will reflect the light and uh, it will reflect the light and the receiver will sense it. So based on the color, it will reflect different um, light uh, intensive and that, that the light intensive could be used to, um, to categorize the color of the part plus the presence of the part. For example, if the part is shiny and uh, is silver, we will receive a high intensive um, light. If the part is dark, the most of the light will be absorbed by the part. Okay, so this is the difference between the diffuse ones and retro reflective sensors. What are features or general features of optoelectric sensors? Have long sensing distance specifically for the true beam sensors or retro reflective sensors. On a true beam sensors, they have a longer sensing distance. For example, uh, true beam sensors can detect objects more than 10 meters away. So both sender receivers should be adjusted properly. Um, otherwise, the receiver won't receive the light. So this is impossible with magnetic, ultrasonic, or other sensing methods. So with any proximity sensors or magnetic ultrasonic sensors, we cannot sense 10 meter away uh, apart in a 10 meter away from the sensor. Virtually no sensing object restrictions are not limited like proximity sensors to detecting metal objects. This means they can be used to detect virtually any object, including glass, plastic, wood, and liquid. Fast response time, light travels at high speed, and the sensor performs no mechanical operations, high resolutions, advanced design technologies will lead to detecting very small objects, as well as precise position detection. Non-contact sensing objects can be detected without physical contact. Color identification, the rate at which an object reflects or absorbs light depends on both the wavelengths of the emitted light and the color of the object. So we could uh, categorize uh, the color of the object. Easy adjustment, positioning the beam on an object is simple with uh, models that emit visible light because the emit is visible, okay? So those that have uh, visible light are easy to be adjusted. There are some, uh, some types that works based on non-visible light. Okay, we will explain them. And those ones, of course, are tougher to be adjusted and they need a specific device. Rectolinear propagation, when light travels through air or water, it always travels in a straight uh, line. Refraction, refraction is the phenomenon of light being deflected as it passes obliquely through the boundary between two media with different refractive indices. So for example, uh, it uh, if, the light travels obliquely from air to the glass and then to the air, we have these reactive indices of 1, 1.5, and 1 for different media here. Reflection, regular, regular reflection, a flat surface such as glass or mirror, reflects light at an angle in, equal to the incident angle of the light. Okay, so these two angles are equal, and this is a mirror. Retro reflection, a corner cube. So this is a re, uh, retro reflection mirror. This is the mirror that we talk about that, the special mirror. 
A corner cube uses three flat surfaces perpendicular to each other. Why we use this uh, retro reflective type of mirrors? Uh, I will explain that later. Okay. And we have diffuse reflection uh, made surfaces such as white paper reflect light in all directions. So this is a reflection by a regular uh, part. Okay, could be a, a black surface. We could have a black surface. We could have a red color. Any material. It doesn't need to be a mirror. Could reflect in some extent. Could reflect light, and we call it diffuse reflection. What type of light sources we could have or light generation? We could have pulse modulated light. The majority of photoelectric sensors use pulse modulated light that basically emit light repeatedly at fixed interval. The effects of external light interfaces are easily removed. So if we use a normal light, the um, the optoelectric sensor cannot differentiate between an environment light and the light from the optoelectric emitter. So to, to differentiate between these two and reduce the effect of interfaces, then we could use this pulse modulated light. Non-modulated light, uninterrupted beam of light at a specific intensity that use with uh, certain types of sensors, such as mark sensor, fast response times, short sensing distance, and susceptibility uh, to external light interfaces. So these ones um, uh, are better basically choices than this non-modulated light in most cases. Okay, so light sensor, this is uh, light source. Uh, Okay, so this is a wavelength um, of the light and light intensity. Um, for example, red laser has uh, almost almost 700 uh, wavelengths in nanom uh, nanometer, and we have we could have, for example, infrared LED, and those are non-visual or non-visible, sorry, non-visible lights. Okay, so these are visible light. These are, these two are non-visible light, either if you use ultraviolet light range or if you use infrared range. Okay, so another type of uh, retro, um, sorry, optoelectric sensors, but we don't have them is, uh, uh, triangulation. What is triangulation? We have the emitter element that sends the light and we have two lenses here and we have this is the emitter lens and this is a receiver lens and finally we have a detector or receiver of the light. So when the object is closed uh, the light will reflect to the point A if the object is far the light will be reflected to the point B. And uh, by these type of sensors also, we could, uh, uh, we could measure the, the distance of the object from the emitter. Okay, so true beam sensor, uh, we explain that later, uh, also is used in the, uh, in the creeper on the handling station. Um, uh, they have these true beam sensors have stable operation and long sensing distances ranging from several centimeters to several tens of meters. Sensing unaffected by changes in the sensing object path and operation not greatly affected by sensing object loss, um, color, or inclination. And diffuse reflective sensors, as I explained. Uh, the object itself will reflect the light, and this unit has both emitter and receiver unit, sensing distance ranging from several centimeters to several meters. 
easy mounting adjustment, the intensity of reflected light, operating stability, and the sensing distance vary with the conditions, color, and smoothness on the surface of the sensing object. And retro reflective sens sensors, uh, we have emitter and receiver and retro reflector, sensing distance ranging from several centimeters to several meters, simple wiring and uh, optical uh, access adjustment, operation not greatly affected by the color or angle of a sensing object, light passes through the sensing object twice, making these sensors suitable for sensing transparent object. Because we know that transparent object uh, would pass the light, but when the light passes an object twice, uh, a, a transparent object twice, and the light basically will be refracted and the light won't back to the receiver and we could sense the part. Sensing object with the mirror finish may not be detected because the amount of light reflected back to the receiver from such shiny surfaces makes it appear as true no sensing object is present. This problem can be, can be overcome using the MSR or mirror surface rejection function. Okay, so if we use a special type of mirror, which are these retro reflector mirrors, and we use the MSR feature, then we could uh, uh, we could avoid these disadvantages on these retroreflective sensors, and retroreflective sensors have a dead zone at close distance. Another type of optical sensors are distance um, setable sensors. Again, we have uh, we have an emitter and we have a receptors or a receiver. We have far and uh, near uh, ranges. And based on the distance of the part from the emitter, uh, the, the light could be reflected to the far or near range, and the sensor could know exactly uh, where uh, is the range of the part location. Operations not greatly affected by sensing object surface conditions or color, and operation not greatly affected by the background. Another type is limited reflective sensors. We have emitter and receiver, and there is an angle between them, so you could also sense the object um, at the, <clears throat> the distance uh, plus the uh, basically the height in some uh, extent. Uh, small differences in height can be detected. The distance from the sensor can be limited to, def uh, to, to detect only objects in a specific area. Operations not greatly affected by sensing object colors, and operation is greatly affected by glossiness or inclination of the sensing object. So different type of optical sensors we have uh, discussed so far could be used in uh, different scenarios and uh, for different purposes. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the optical optoelectric sensors on MPS 500 and uh, not only on MPS 500, also on any industrial uh, applications, they have uh, two indicators. They have uh, operation indicator and stability indicator. So operation indicator for all cases, orange and the stability indicator is green. So uh, these uh, indicators shows us if the sensor works properly or is adjusted and tuned properly. <clears throat> so these functions alert the operator when the sensor changes from stable state to an unstable state, and the function can be broadly classified into uh, display uh, functions. So uh, if the sensor is not stable, the operator should uh, again adjust the sensor and make it stable um, stability indicator or green LED, the amount of margin with respect to environment changes. 
temperature, voltage, DOS, etc. after inst installation is monitored by the self-diagnosed function and indicated by an indicator. <clears throat> okay, I, um, I will explain it here uh, when I finish the reading. Operation indicator or orange LED indicates the output status. Output functions, the, the margin is indicated by an indicator light and the state of output to alert the operator. Okay, so here this is the incident light. Okay, this is the light that uh, received by the receiver. So you see the intensity of the light received by the receiver. So when the intensity of the light is below 0.8% or 0.9% or if the incident light intensity is above 1.1 to 1.2, then the green light indicator or the stability indicator is on. Otherwise, is off. So what is the meaning of that? So when the intensity of the light is less than 0.8%, it means that the light, uh, sorry, the object is not present. We don't have any object. And because the intensity is, is low enough, we could say that this signal is reliable. When the object is present and the intensity is high and is more than 1.1, um, again, the green light is on. It shows us the signal is reliable and the sensor status is stable. When the intensity of the light is between 0 0.8 and 1.1, we cannot trust the incident light. It could be from the environment, it could be from another sources, and we cannot trust that. So that's why the green LED is off here and shows that the status of the sensor is kind of shaky and is not reliable. We need to tune it. Okay, what is the orange LED? So the orange LED, whenever we have a light or incident light uh, with the intensity of above one, the orange light is on, okay? So the orange indicator shows us that we have an incident light, okay? But if the light is reliable or not, or if the signal is reliable or not, it's not clear. We should check it by the green LED, okay? So this, this orange uh, indicator is exactly the signal that goes to the PLC. When the orange LED is off, the output of the sensor is false or zero. When the orange LED is on, the output of the sensor is, uh, is true or one, <clears throat> okay? But either that signal, either the off signal or the on signal, false signal or true signal uh, uh, are reliable, depends on the green LED. Okay, so always the operator should check uh, status and stability and reliability of the sensor by these stability indicators. Okay, so different scenarios could happen when both the orange and the green LED, both of them are on. <clears throat> so we could say uh, a party's presence, uh, the a signal is reliable, everything is okay. We have another scenario at the end when the green LED is on and the orange LED is off. It means that there is no any part. Again, the signal, the false signal from the sensor is reliable, trusted, it's okay. But the issue is that <clears throat> when the green LED is off. So for the green LED off, the orange light could be either on and off for both the cases, the signal is not reliable, and why that happens could be because of different scenarios. For example, this case, the green uh, LED is off and the orange LED is on. 
because, for example, we have misalignment here and the receiver is receiving some part of the light, or there is a dust and the intensity of the light is not high enough. Or, for example, the orange LED is off, the green LED is off. Why? Because of this scenario. Again, misalignment. Okay? Or uh, there is a, a, a basically, uh, yeah, so this is a misalignment or there is a noise here. <clears throat> so it means that uh, we are getting we are getting some uh, part of the light reflected back to the receiver. We have some intensity, but is not high enough or is not low enough. It it falls between 0 0.8 and 1.1 range, and that's why the uh, the signal is not reliable. So. Always, we want to have the green light or stability light on um, so we could trust the output of the sensor. If the green LED is not on, we always have a very small setting uh, screw and we could, uh, we could adjust that set screw and or we could uh, again align the sensor properly okay or clean it from the dirt and dust or check the electrical connection and check the noise um, or if the part is uh, uh, basically defective and is uh, faulty uh, we need to change it okay uh, we need to talk about uh, also proximity sensors and uh, different type of proximity sensors, inductive sensors and capacitive sensors. Uh, and we need also to continue and talk about uh, uh, potentiometers and comparators. Uh, let's uh, have that in a separate video for another session because I think uh, is lengthy enough. This video is about one hour. <clears throat> Again, I uh, recommend you to um, download um, MPS 500 a demo video plus separate video of the stations and review them as you go forward through all this course and, uh, and uh, basically this slide. <clears throat>